Welcome back. Today I'm going to open up a can of worms and I'm going to talk about accuracy. I get questions about accuracy or sometimes it's the lack thereof. What, 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 what's going on with my gun is doing this, that, or the other thing. And um, very often I can tell that somebody is uh, maybe a little bit jaded. Uh, they just bought a rifle and it's not getting that, you know, that iconic MOA accuracy that, uh, that everybody is talking about. And uh, that sometimes is an unfair standard to place upon yourself or your rifle. Let's talk about accuracy in realistic terms for us and let's define what we're talking about because accuracy can mean different things to different people. Accuracy can be an absolute thing to a uh, bench rest shooter, somebody who's in the bench rest competition uh, field and you know they're looking to shoot point zero 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 you know just in other words in the same hole all day long that's what they dream about that's accuracy of a different standard than uh, the person who buys a, a model 94 winchester or, or a 336 marlin or a henry and uh, and he's basically going out deer hunting and accurate to him is meaning means getting his deer each year that's accurate he may you know my my uh, my old acquaintances back in the 50s and 60s I don't think they even had a clue what their what their gun printed on paper they just knew that the sights were regulated from the factory and you know they shot they shot at knot holes in the trees you know from 50 paces and they hit the knot hole and they said the gun's accurate. That was all that was necessary for them. So, and they got their deer every year. And I talked about that, you know, back in a video previously, you know, they got a box of ammo when they bought the gun and that, that ammo was depleted, you know, one round, at, one round at a time each year until finally, you know, the flap was falling off and the, the box inside was empty. So that was, that was the standard that uh, was applied to accuracy in those days. And it was sufficient. It was more than sufficient. I'm going to talk about grading your accuracy in a minute. Then there's the sort of accuracy that uh, has evolved over the years with bolt-action rifles. Uh, back in, back in uh, the venerable Jack O'Connor's day, uh, an accurate rifle back in the, back in the 40s, uh, late 30s and 40s and, and uh, 50s, uh, you know, an accurate rifle was defined as one that could shoot a two-inch two inch, two and a quarter inch group. That was considered a very good, high grade uh, rifle for long range prairie use. So remember that now, we're talking about rifles that, it can shoot, that could shoot up to two and a half inch groups out of the box. That was considered a standard in those days for uh, a highly accurate rifle. Since bullets have improved, since bullet construction has improved and since barrel construction has uh, you know, improve with, with more, I should say, smoother, smoother internal surfaces. Uh, guns have evolved. This is, this is, most guns now are coming out with free-floated uh, barrels. Uh, many are coming out now with, uh, as this one is, with uh, epoxy bedded, uh, two-point bedding systems in the receiver. Uh, everything, everything has scaled them to a point where these guns now are certainly capable of MOA with the correct uh, ammunition out of the box. And as I've done in the past, let's first of all discuss what MOA means. It does not mean an inch at wherever, whatever distance you happen to be shooting. MOA is, means minute of angle. Now in a, in a circle you got 360 degrees. That circle is divided, those that 360 degrees is further divided down into minutes, so each degree has 60 minutes. One of those minutes, a slice of that, a slice of that circle goes off infinitely, and that hap just happens to be one inch at 100 yards, roughly speaking. It's, it's not exactly that, but it's, for all intents and purposes, MOA means one inch at 100 yards. It means two inches at 200 yards. It means 10 inches at 1,000 yards and so forth. So when somebody says that they shot uh, MOA, MOA at 50 yards, no, if he's, if he's shooting a one inch group at 50 yards, that's two MOA, two minutes of angle. Okay, so 
Now, when it comes to when it comes to various standards of accuracy, uh, there have been standards that are pretty much applied through the industry through the years, and these are not these are not written down any place. And I don't want somebody to write me and tell me well, where do you see this. This is this is basically this is just common industry standards that have been used for many, many years. They're what you would call acceptable in the industry, and they're certainly acceptable to the, the public that were buying those guns through the years, and even to the military. The military actually did have a standard of four MOA for infantry rifles. Most infantry rifles were probably better than that, but that was, that was the gold standard, was a four MOA rifle. I don't know if that standard has changed since the 30s, 40s, and 50s, or whatever, but that was the standard at one time was for MOA. That meant that a soldier could engage an enemy as far away as he could uh, shoot with his open sights, with his iron sights, and strike an enemy uh, most of the time. That's all, that's all that they were looking for. So I'm gonna set three, I'm gonna set three standards that I consider to be uh, legitimate. And I think if you, if you listen to why, you'll understand. Functional accuracy is out to 150 yards for many, many rifles. The functional rifle that can shoot uh, between three to four MOA, again, this is probably military standard, that would, be, that, would be this, that would be this Model 94 Winchester. I can do better than that with some loads. Uh, some, some loads I've, I've got that I can, I can shoot two and three quarters uh, of an inch groups on occasion, uh, down to you know, maybe three and a quarter inch groups on occasion, three inch groups. I'm limited, I'm limited by, first of all, the rather, this is, this is a rather coarse buckhorn sight, uh, you know, in a bead. Uh, it's not. It's got a. It's got only a 20-inch barrel, so it's got a very short length. Uh, it's got a very short sighting plane. Uh, it's not. It's. It's not fully stocked, so it's difficult to really. It's difficult to really get a good cheek weld on this gun and things like that. So within its limitations, uh, this gun is capable of three to four MOA, and that's minute of deer. That's that's going to bring home my deer any time I want out to 150 yards or more. So that's, that's a reasonable standard of accuracy for such a rifle. That's also a very reasonable standard of accuracy for uh, most uh, AR-15s. Now, people are going to snicker at that, but I can guarantee you that most AR-15s, if, if they don't have a free-floated barrel, you're going to be shooting somewheres around, with many of them, you're going to be shooting somewheres around 3 to 4 MOA. That's about, that's about typical for uh, an AR-15. And if you do better than that, and again, don't write me and tell me that you, that you get you know, three quarters MOA. I'm sure you do. There are many, uh, my, my national match barrel here, uh, this, will, this, will perform, this will perform very, very highly. Uh, you know, I've, I've, shot, I've shot half and three-quarter MOA groups with certain loads with this with, uh, uh, with no trouble whatsoever. This is, this is when I strap this on my, uh, either it's on my Colt chassis or if it's on my homemade chassis, whichever it is, it's going to shoot because it's got that barrel that's free-floated. Um, the next level of accuracy I would call standard Standard hunting grade accuracy, and this is good for long range shooting at big at big game. Uh, it's it's satisfactory for uh, you know anything anything that's medium game at long range, uh, coyotes even at long range. And we're talking at a, a standard which pretty much goes back to the older standard, which was very very satisfactory for many years, and that's inch and a half to two and three quarter inch groups at a hundred yards. So one and a half to two and three quarter MOA. If you have a if you have a rifle that comes out of the box and you put factory ammo in it and you're shooting one and a half MOA, you get yourself a dandy. That's a very nice rifle and you don't have to go any farther than that. You've got a rifle that you can take out any place out in Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, or wherever you might want to be. And at 375 to 400 yards, your bullet's going to be striking exactly where you want with very, very little uh, displacement from your aiming point. Some rifles can even shoot 
greater groups, bigger, bigger groups than that, and you're still going to be fine. The guy who has a the guy who has a 300 Winchester Magnum that's going after nothing but elk, if he has a 3 MOA gun, he's got a fine gun for shooting elk at, at 350 yards. And I'm certainly not about to be recommending taking elk beyond uh, 300 yards most of the time because you've got a big creature that can very easily amble off on you and you can lose him. I'll get into ethics some other time in a different video. Um, then we get down to... <coughs> Then we get down to the Holy Grail, which is varmint grade accuracy. This is where this is where basically there is no bottom. You can go as low as you want, but it's less than inch and a half, less than minute and a half groups. Then then you've you've got a legitimate varmint grade barrel, and you've got a legitimate varmint grade ammunition to put in it. So that's the sort of accuracy that you want for a varmint grade gun. Many varmint great guns and many large game guns. This this rifle here is capable of. Uh, I've I've shot many three eighths of an inch groups with this model seventy with hundred thirty grain standard hundred thirty grain uh, bullets, and uh, it it doesn't mean that that shoots all the time three quarters three eighths of an inch, but this will certainly shoot uh, three quarters to seven eighths of an inch with hunting grade loads, big game loads all the time. These guns have just gotten so much better than they were uh, not too many years ago. 20 years ago, you could not expect that kind of accuracy. But again, with the three floating and the glass bedded uh, receiver, everything about these guns and the, the hammer, the cold hammer forged barrels, they just, they just do superbly. And you know, target, target crown, everything is built for accuracy and the trigger. Trigger is essential to uh, high accuracy. If you want to have if you want to have good accuracy, the best accuracy, you're not going to get it with a you're not going to get it with a four and a half or six pound trigger and you're certainly not going to get it if you've got a lot of creep in the trigger and drag and things like that that I've spoken about in previous videos. So let's talk about let's talk about accuracy problems. I think, again, you have to have a reasonable understanding about what you're looking at on paper. Um, you, you, can, you, can tell, you can tell if you've got a dysfunctional gun immediately by looking at the sort of groups that, you, that you're getting. First of all, if the groups are just falling apart, if, in other words, that the shots are just not there everywhere, and I'm talking about everywhere, sometimes you can't even find them on the paper. The very first thing you want to look at is your sighting system make sure it's screwed down tightly because and I don't mean I don't mean that you're torquing the rings I'm not talking about your torque setting on your on your bases or anything I'm talking about looseness physical looseness anytime you have any kind of rattling around or looseness you've got a problem the slightest degree of looseness on a, on the rear sight or the front sight or the scope is going to cause incredible loss of accuracy downrange um, I watched a fellow one day at, at the range, and he was having unbelievable amount of trouble. He was, he was throwing one shot after another with his Mini-14 downrange, and uh, I could tell he was very frustrated, and I asked if, you know, if I could help. And uh, he said, sure. So he just stood back, and, and um, he knew me, and I, I just took a look. Immediately, I could tell that the, the, gun, was, the, the gun was coming apart. The, the, the scope, the scope rings were literally loose, and <coughs> he had he had impromptly uh, positioned them. Base, and I went through this with a, a different video on setting up Ruger rings. Ruger rings, the bases, the, the bases of those rings have to be set first in their little notches. Their little, uh, basically, they're they're like they're like little half moon uh, notches in the top of the receiver. Those have to be perfectly situated before you put the scope in, and those have to be tight before you put the scope in. Once you put the scope in, then you can clamp things down with your upper section of your rings. But if you don't, you can't do it the other way around because once you once you get the uh, the rings mounted to the scope and try to get it lined up on the uh, receiver, you're going to have one one ring is going to be pulling one ring is going to be pulling against the other, and they're just going to start loosening up immediately. Those thumb screws will back off. So that was a, that was immediately apparent when I first received my 
M16 rifle in the 60s when I was in the Army down at Fort Gordon at basic training. Now I was, a, I was already a very, very accomplished shot by the time I was uh, in, the, in the Army. Uh, I had been shooting for a long time uh, as a kid. And I, and I already knew about sights and you know the things that could happen with them. Well, this, the, the AR-15 rear sight was loose. Um, and I, I spoke with my, my DI and I said, gee, you know, I, I really have to have a different, I have to have a different gun before I can start using this uh, for qualification or for practice. I said, because this, this rear sight is loose. And he took a look at it and he said, well, he, see, he was a DI, but he was, not a, he was not familiar with firearms. He says, that should be okay, you know, it's not that loose. Well, I knew, you know, my eyes rolled and I said, boy, you know, loose is loose. And it means that that thing could be off as much as a foot or two, you know, down range at 100 yards, 100 meters. Well, anyway, I, I managed to convince him that I needed to have the armor take a look at that rifle, and they replaced that rifle with a different one. I, everything was fine from that point on. But uh, that was because the day we went to the 1,000-inch range, this is where you're shooting, you know, 25 yards, you're shooting at a, at a target. It looked like an upside-down, it looks like an upside-down rear notch sight. And, uh, I, you know, I, I was only getting groups like this at 25 yards, and even he could see that there was a real problem with that because he tried it himself. So that's how that got resolved, but that's how badly a, a, you know, a loose sight can affect things. So the very first thing you want to check is physical looseness in the sighting system. Looseness can also occur on the internals of a scope. Check the tracking on your scope. Make sure that you know when you set that when you set that rifle and scope solid, solidly in a padded uh, situation where it can't move. That you can rotate both turrets for elevation and windage and make sure that they track accurately back and forth on the paper. You, if you put a if you put a sighting in target that's got the that's got the grid lines the MOA grid lines, you should be able to track that crosshair going crosswise on that paper consistent with the clicks that you're turning it and it shouldn't be it shouldn't be sloppy and it shouldn't have any backlash it shouldn't go out it shouldn't go out eight clicks and then not return until you turn two or three clicks and then start coming back it should go out eight and it should come back eight with no backlash it shouldn't hesitate to come back remember that when you're looking through a scope there's an inverter mechanism inside that scope because if you if you just built a telescope without having the inverter you'd be looking at everything upside down inside out because that's the way if you if you have a celestial telescope and you look at the sky you're looking at the sky backwards you know the the, the big dipper is upside down because that's the way that's the way optics are unless they put an inverter inside so remember that when you're looking at the crosshairs, as you're turning the as you're turning the thing where it says uh, t left, the crosshairs are actually going to be going right on you. Turn it on the other way for you. But that's the way it is. So everything is going to be backwards. So that's not a problem when you're turning the when you're turning the turret where it says down. The crosshair is actually going to be going up. Okay. So check your tracking and check and make sure that your you know that your clicks are what they say they are. Barrel interference is probably one of the most common things that uh, can occur with a gun. This has to do with the actual rifle itself. It can be barrel interference with, uh, with the stock and the barrel. In other words, check if you've got a, if you've got a free floated gun, make sure that it's free floated consistently all the way back because if your barrel is slapping, it, if it's colliding with that stock, you're going to have issues. You're better off if the gun were firmly bedded within the stock all the way than if you have it actually banging into it. That's really bad because that, that's inconsistent depending on how much, uh, how much weight you're applying and where you're applying it on the front end. So those vibrations can change. There should be no, collide, no colliding with the, with the uh, stock whatsoever. And if you're shooting, you never ever place that barrel on your resting surface. Never rest that barrel on anything. Always rest, always rest the gun on the stock. When you rest that barrel, you're going to throw your group, you're going to throw that shot way, way out of your group, and I mean several inches. 
uh, lighter barrels, uh, it's going to be significant. But you know, I had a I had a Ruger uh, model seventy seven twenty two many years ago, and due to bedding issues with that, with improper influence on the uh, fore end of the barrel, the, the front of the barrel by the fore end, I was getting changes in the I was getting changes in the group that was six inches at a uh, hundred a hundred yards until I rectified that. It was literally the barrel was not secured solidly against the receiver and it was causing issues with in, in, inconsistent uh, foreign contact. So that was, that's how that influences thing. Barrel interference is a very, very significant thing with many rifles just by their own design. So, you know, the Model 94, 336 Marlin or Henry, whatever it is, You've got barrel interference from the get-go here. You've got a you've got a fore-end barrel band. You've got a, a stock band. Those things are interfering with the barrel to some degree, and that's that's interfering with vibrations, depending on how many rounds you have left in the magazine and how much weight is in the magazine. It changes the vibrations on that barrel. So you know that's those are all things that cause barrel interference, and that's why there's limitations on the type of accuracy that you can expect from certain firearms. Um, the receiver loose or improperly bedded, uh, unstable. The receiver should be ideally the receiver. I consider the best, the best bedding system possible to be a two point epoxy bedded system. One that's bedded, one that's bedded at the front and a rear screw. Now, if you don't have, many rifles will shoot extremely well without having uh, two-point epoxy bedding. That's fine, and, and uh, you know, I've got, a, I've got a, um, a number of rifles that will shoot that way, that have shot that way uh, from the get-go. They had just very good, solid, solidly bedded receivers, and they shot like a house of fire. And that's fine, but if you want the very finest degree of accuracy, you have to do what this manufacturer, what FN does with their Winchesters now and their and their Brownings, is that's a two-point uh, epoxy bedding system. Um, that will that will derive your most solid receiver contact. But on an elementary basis, it means just checking your stock screws, making sure that your stock screws are screwed down tightly. Torque is really not as big. I, I did a video on torque. The most important thing is to have them tight, reasonably tight. And when I say reasonably tight, you know, using a screwdriver, don't use, never use a wrench on a, a stock screw. You're going you're gonna to split your wood. You, absolutely, that's way too much torque. So, uh, simply a, a hand filling screwdriver turned around and tightened with the gun and the vise and you've got enough and you don't have you don't have to reef it down you don't have to have big guns to do this or anything and you don't have to have a torque wrench if you're talking about actual torque value you're probably talking about 25 to 30 pounds inch pounds 25 to 30 inch pounds maximum for for stock screws the most important thing is if if you've got a good solid uh, bedding system when those screws come in tight and they're tightened up, the screws stop. That's all they do. They don't continue to squish down and you don't feel it turning into, you know, five inch pounds and 10 inch pounds, then 15 and 20 and so forth until you finally can't turn it anymore. Good stock bedding system, that those screws should go in and they should, they should be clamped in within about a 90 degree turn. In other words, from the time they from the time they stop turning reasonably, then all of a sudden you squish them down. That's the final 90, 90 degrees or so. That's, that's a good bedding system when you have that. And pillar bedding systems will give you that. So solid receiver bedding. Crown damage. Crown damage is something that you don't very frequently see, but you can certainly see it on older used rifles and rifles that have, you know, gotten damage uh, where somebody it, I remember I remember it was not uncommon when I was growing up there were there were some people in town that used to they used to drive around town with their rifle you know they had their model 742 Remington with the barrel stuck against the you know the floorboards of the truck 
And that's how they drove around because, you know, that way there they could exit the truck really easy without, you know, turning it around and all that. So to them that was logical to, to, stuff, that, to stuff that gun barrel into the rug of their truck or the, or the rubber mat that was all sandy and, and gravel and everything else. They didn't think anything of it. But that will certainly damage the crown of a gun. And that, by the way, why they put a rounded, a rounded field crown on a lot of rifles, especially in the past, where you have is one right here. Uh, this is a this is a rounded this is a rounded field crown, and that's why they did that was because that that crown uh, literally protect the uh, where the where the rifling the bore ends, so that even if I even if I hit that with something, it's going to protect where the barrel uh, the bore comes through. So watch for the crown and if you think you have any issues with if you have any issues with w wide groups but they're usually consistently wide they you know if you have looseness in something shots are everywhere and they don't have a reason they just land in different places all the time but if you have if you have something which is uh, like a, a a poor crown it'll cause a consistently uh, open group because that same that same defect is constant it doesn't change from one shot to another Bullets too long for the twist rate. I'm not talking about weight. I'm talking about bullet length. And I did an entire video on uh, twist rates, and I, I encourage you to watch the video on twist rates because if you have anything to do with uh, hand loading yourself and you're loading up uh, bullets which are long, you've got to know what the twist rate of your rifle is and whether the bullets are correspondingly the right length for that twist rate because it's a length issue it is not a weight issue very frequently people think that weight is the issue it's not it's length because as i showed in that other video you can have you can have bullets which are very very long which are lighter than bullets which are much heavier that are, that are uh, blunter in other words have a have a more pronounced ogive long slender bullets uh, you can take you can take a you can take a bullet which is say 130 grain 270 bullet and if you if you squish the ogive and make it and and squish it in it suddenly becomes longer that that bullet may not stabilize in some barrels if it's if it's really long like if it's a burger it, it may be a burger uh, super duper long ogive bullet and may not stabilize in some barrels so now we have a um, Poor ammo. That's a very common. That's a very common thing. Before you go considering, you know, trading in your gun or getting rid of it, just try a different brand of ammo because not all ammo uh, is is going to work in all guns. And don't think that just because you know your your cousin Fred is shooting dandy groups with uh, the, you know his Hornady Superformance loads in his rifle that is going to necessarily shoot super great, super great groups in your rifle because it may certainly not. A lot has to do with, a lot has to do with barrel vibration, the, the thickness, diameter, taper of the barrel, length of it and everything else and that, that is very often uh, the difference between a, a bullet or a load shooting well in one given uh, rifle or another. So uh, don't condemn a rifle until you check it out with different ammo. You might have to try several brands of ammo to find the one that actually shoots. So, and very frequently a, a rifle will have a sweet spot for a certain brand or type of ammo. And sometimes the lowliest ones of all, the ones that nobody else will even buy on the shelf, are the ones that sometimes will work in your gun because it just happens to be the right combination of powder and bullet. Poor rest support. Now we're starting to get into we're starting to get into the dynamics, the actual physical shooting of uh, you know taking the gun out there and, and testing it. You need to have very very good support. In in my other videos, you'll see you know when I was shooting my 257 Roberts in one of my videos and my my Tika uh, 222. Um, You'll notice that I was using a very good support. Now you don't have to buy a very, very exotic support. It can be nothing more than it can be nothing more than sandbags that are filled up with uh, filled up with sand, and uh, you know maybe covered with a blanket so that they don't scratch your rifle. And that can be a sufficient and a very, very good solid rest. 
but you should always make sure it's, it's a resilient rest and nothing which is going to bang and, and cause uh, undue vibrations. Uh, at our range, I mean, they, they always, every, it seems like every range, somebody at the club decides they're going to do a good deed by putting out these two by fours, maybe with notches cut in them with a band saw or something so that guys can lay their rifles. I don't know why they have, I don't know why they have like three or four notches, they're di diff different sizes, I guess, for different rifles and fore ends. But that's the last thing that you should be using as a fore end rest because that, that slapping off of the off of the uh, board is not only uh, not conducive to accuracy; it's also going to damage your fore end of your rifle. It's, it's not good. So have yourself a good, solid, resilient rest. It's, it's a sandbag is a sandbag is the correct density. So whether the sandbag is mounted on a you know tripod rest like a like a Hoppy's inexpensive Hoppy's rest, or if it's mounted on something more you know like a Caldwell rest that like I have or something with you know, all kinds of adjustment. Anything like that is fine, but it should be a sandbag rest that cradles that foreign. Um, and also, too, you should have a good solid rear bag, a good rear bag rest. I like to use, as I showed in, you in those videos, a good, you know, a, a good rabbit ear bag that really cradles it and that you can squish with your fingers. That's the sort of rest that uh, anybody in bench rest competition will use, and because uh, that, that provides an absolutely stable, consistent shooting platform. And that's the key, is consistency. You know, shooting accuracy from one shot to another is all about consistency. Doing everything exactly the same from one to another. You know, just like a pitcher on the mound. You know, when he's thinking about throwing his fastball, it's, it's got to be the same fastball he threw to the catcher the last time he threw a fastball. Otherwise, that catcher is not he's not going to be in tune with you. Um, so consistency is the name of the game. And that brings us to poor shooting technique. Um, this is a really, this is a really difficult topic. <laughs> I, I, I remember, I remember vividly this gentleman that was uh, at the range a few years ago and he was he was just getting his he was just getting his brand new AR-15 all ready to shoot national match. He was he wanted to get into CMP shooting, and so he had himself a specification. You know, nothing greater than four and a half power scope, and um, he had the correct setup. He had a national match barrel. He had the whole works going and everything, and I, I could tell. I mean, I could tell he he was totally inexperienced about bench rest shooting. So uh, he was having he was having a lot of frustrations. He he couldn't get his he couldn't get his groups to come in tight, and I looked at the setup and I didn't see anything wrong, you know. And, and he was he was telling me that he just couldn't he couldn't get any groups in there. They were they were just big groups, uh, you know, nothing like you'd expect to see from such a nice rifle and scope setup as that. So I I took a look at it and you know I. I just said, can, do you mind if I just take a, you know, take a few shots at it? And um, I turned it down to, I turned it down to one power. I just wanted to see, I just wanted to see how, you know, the, the uh, power ring did on the front, I mean, on the back. And so I turned it down to one power and uh, I, I laid in just, you know, five shots down range. And um, then I turned it up to I turned it up to four power, four and a half power, and I fired another five shots downrange. And the the guy the guy said, "Wow," because he was looking at it through his spotting scope. He said, "Wow." He said, "Those are all going into this almost the same hole." I said, "Well, that's." I said, "I'm, I said, I'm sorry." I said, it's, "It's the gun is shooting great." I said, "You've got a great rifle here. Whoever sighted it in for you did a nice job." So. Um, he was just having difficulties with his shooting technique. His shooting style was such that every time he fired a shot from the bench, it was a different style than he did the time before. And as when I was watching him, I could tell. One time he would shoot with the, he would shoot with the his his hand out here underneath the rest, and he's shooting like this. And the next time he's he's got it back here, and the thing is sitting on the rest. And the next time he's got it, and he's not. He's not even using the same cheek weld. So everything was different from one shot to another. And so he was not applying any matter of manner of consistency. And he was not sitting straight up and down perpendicular at the bench. 
So after, after a little bit of instruction, and we just went over a few basics, he was doing fine, and he was shooting very, very nice, solid, tight groups the way that gun was capable of. So be very careful to assess your own shooting, uh, your own shooting capability, what you're, what you're actually doing. Because, you know, shooting at a bench is not an automatic, you know, one holer. That does not mean that just because you've got a bench under you with a sandbag that you're going to be shooting straight. Not by any means. Anybody who's in the bench rest game knows that. The last thing we get into is weather conditions. People are frequently stymied by what they see on paper and they don't relate it to the weather conditions. I've watched people climb right off, right off the center of the group and go up three or four inches shooting one shot after another and I, I, I knew they were going to do that just because of the day. Very humid conditions, conditions where, you know, when you're looking through the scope, you see this mirage constantly where your crosshair is. And sometimes the, sometimes the, the bullseye actually just disappears for an instant because it's, it becomes so thick that the bullseye just disappears behind it. When you see that, whenever, and that's why it's important to allow your barrel to cool between shots, because if you happen to be out on a dense day when you have that kind of, when you have that kind of aberration in the scope, where you see what, what I call, it looks like oil in a swimming pool, and that's what, that's what Warren Page called it. When you see that, don't, don't think that that's a good day to be out testing ammo. That is not a good day to be out testing ammo because what's going to happen is that mirage is going to do the same thing as it does when you're out on a long highway in a hot day and you see something down the road, a truck coming at you, and the truck is not up, he's not on the road, he's up in the air. The truck seems to be flying along, you know, three feet over, over the ground. That's exactly what you're getting with Mirage when you're shooting on a day like that. The, the, the position of your crosshair will not be where you think it is. In other words, you're going to be seeing your crosshair on the bullseye, but it's really not on the bullseye anymore. It's floating above the bullseye because the bullseye now, the image of the bullseye in refracted that water in the air due to refraction. It's the same as looking at a fish in the water. The fish isn't where you think he is. He's, he's, he's here because the water refracts and causes that the, light, the, the light waves to bend. So when you see the bullseye here, you're shooting, you're shooting at the bullseye and your bullet is landing above the bullseye because you're shooting at the image of the bullseye, not the actual bullseye. Bench rest shooters who win the game are the ones that understand that and can read that mirage. They, they actually watch to see how much that bullseye is jumping up and down in the air or how much it's floating side by side, which means that the wind is carrying that, uh, that denseness in the atmosphere. So they, they account for that. They read it and they can read those, they can read those waves. But that's not a day to be out. That, that may be a good day for competing to see how you are against your buddies down the other side of the table, uh, how, they, how they shoot versus you. That's a good competition exercise, but that's not a day to be out testing your gun and testing your ammo. So I've covered it all, I think. Uh, it's a very nebulous word. Accuracy can mean so much, but I hope I helped iron it out a little bit so that you can understand uh, what you should be looking for reasonably with the rifle that you're using and for what purposes that you're using it. So thanks for watching. Benny's doing great. He was down, he was down here a moment ago and having a great time. So thanks for watching and God bless.